They say you can't have too many clamps. And yeah, I do okay. But as far as machining, I'm clamp poor. So I'm going to make some cant twist clamps. I've got plenty of offcuts which should do the trick, and who doesn't love a bit of craft time? I'll start by tracing out some rough outlines onto this stainless sheet. Then I'll bandsaw them out to manageable pieces. This is the ideal job for the bandsaw, because it stubbornly refuses to cut straight lines. Now I can make a better outline, using some spray paint, but before we get into that, there's already a detour. All that sawing reminded me that the table on my bandsaw is comically small, so I'm going to make a slightly bigger one, which will make the rest of the bandsaw work much easier and safer. First of all, I'll find a rectangle inside this offcut. Now I'll clamp it to some blocks in the vise to give it a bit more rigidity. I should set up the angle plate, but there are lots of things I should do. I'll clean off the edges and deburr them. Deburring helps me get hold of it properly in the mill. Now I did try using a tiny end mill to produce this slot, but I'm no expert with stainless, and I ended up breaking the tool. So instead I bandsawed the slot, and sanded and filed it to width. Who doesn't love hand filing stainless steel? Anyway, new table installed, and now it's much easier to cut these things out. I won't show you all the cutting, but here's the proof that I did a lot more cutting. And roughly cut out, they look like this. Rusty reckons that I should have just bought a pair of clamps. He just doesn't understand. Now I can grind the plates a little bit closer to the line. I need them all a similar enough shape that I can tack weld them together. They're all square and clamped together now, and I'll do a small tack weld between the layers. I might have used a little too much heat here, because it's eaten into the edges a bit. I also ground these vice contact points just so I can get a good hold. Next I'll use a bit of spray glue and stick the templates on so I've got a good location for the punch marks. I'll transfer those drilling marks and that worked well. Now I'll sit these stacks on the parallels in the vise and using a scrap of copper I'll tap them down so they're seated properly. I'll get my 10mm pointer tool and its collet to line up with those punch marks. As long as they're all match drilled they should work fine. Stainless is a real pain to work with and I just don't have the knack yet. I know we should use low speed and high pressure and I also use lots of lube and my cobalt drills but it's still really prone to work hardening and it was grabbing the tool. Note to self, I need a better drill chuck for the mill. Those holes are now complete, so I can use the belt grinder again to refine the shape. I don't need to worry about the templates at this stage. These are very close to final shape and size and the plates are a fairly organic shape anyway, so I can treat this as a boat building project from here on. If it looks right, it is right. Okay, that completes the deck chairs and the boomerangs. There's a ton of little parts to turn for this project, so I'm not going to show you everything. I'll just show a sample of the operations involved. Turning some shoulders on all these pins and knuckles is one of the steps. 
They all have to be 8mm so that they can fit into the reamed holes on the side plates. I'm finding this ruby stone quite useful for taking off tiny amounts if I've turned something oversize. Two of these knuckles are drilled and tapped M12 for the lead screw to pass through. And they're countersunk, of course, which helps the tap go in. I'm using the pointer in the collet chuck as a tap follower again. Those threads came out nice and cleanly. This is 12L14 steel, which works really easily. And these bearing knuckles have flats milled onto them. This part will be the bearing for the end of the lead screw. Here I'm edge finding on one of the blocks and storing that in the absolute memory of the DRO. And for the other block I'm storing that in the incremental memory. This saves me going back and forth with the edge finder between operations. If you don't have that feature you could just write down a second set of coordinates which would probably still save time. These parts being free turning steel, they're a whole lot easier to drill and tap than the stainless. The reamer goes in like a knife through butter chicken. There's also a whole lot of 12.7mm parts too. About 8 or 10 small pins which have shoulders and threads on both ends. The shoulder is made in the same way, touching off on the length. And out of frame I've got a dial indicator that I set to zero. And for diameters I'm using my crossfeed dial, zeroing it after touch off and I'm relying on that. That crossfeed dial method is not the most accurate so for a bunch of these I had to stone the part to size but after a bit of refinement I got some good fits. This is getting faced off to length. And yes, I'm doing this in the wrong order. I should drill and tap before turning the OD. The tapping operation will actually spread out the material and give me an oversize OD. So although I don't show it, I did have to stone these again. This shows creating the 12mm OD for the threads on the lead screw. I was having problems with this material. I don't think it's actually free turning stock, maybe it's just mild steel, but the thread seems to be a bit ragged and it's like it's tearing rather than cutting. After a bit of refinement I get some nice fits on the threaded knuckle. The rest of the shaft is left at 12.7mm and it's cleaned up with a little bit of scotch bright. Now the lead screw is in the mill, in the collet block, and I'm setting up to drill the cross hole for the T-handle. I've been making an effort to standardise on 10mm tools, so that I'm not changing collets all the time. So far I've got a 10mm pointer tool that I made, the edge finder of course, a spot drill, a countersink, and I've now also got a carbide chamfer mill, and of course ordinary 10mm end mills. I know it only takes 10 or 15 seconds to change a collet, but when you think how many times that happens per project, I think it's a big time saver. Chucks are handy too, but they're big, and it means a lot of table movement. Maybe I'll be a fan of that when I get a Z power feed. I'm actually cheating here and using the carbide chamfer mill as a countersink, just because it's longer than the countersink, and it gives me better access. 
back over to the lathe and we're turning some more small pins. I keep getting a little chip weld happening on the tool there, so I think I need to stay on top of the lube. This time I've drilled and tapped first, before turning to diameter. Now to make some jaws. This is some 25mm aluminium plate. And it gets one edge fly cut. I love this fly cutter. The more I use it, the more I like it. It's kind of hypnotic. It creates a perfect finish and it's great fun to use. The only problem with it is it really sprays the chips. My neighbour says I've got a chip on my shoulder, but that's nothing. I've got them in my hair and down my collar too. No, my mill is not perfectly trammed, it's a tiny fraction of a degree tilted anti-clockwise. But it's so close, I'm not going to mess with it. The block is currently too wide, so I'm going to set my square to 30mm. then double check it against the calipers again, and then scribe out a 30mm line. Now if my brain was not on holiday today, I'd have used the height gauge on the surface plate, because that's exactly what it's for. But my brain is on holiday, so you get to see me doing things the hard way. Here we are chopping that 30mm block off. The new little bandsaw table is a joy, I wish I'd done this sooner. Now I'm just milling the block down to final size. I'm a big fan of that finish. The block needs cutting in half because two of the four jaws will be narrower to go on the inside of the clamps. The quickest way to move material on my mill is with the indexable end mill. I could have stopped short of final size and fly cut the material away, but I had a lot of parts to make and I was running out of time at this point. Edge milling the ends, and again climb cutting and using an air stream to keep the cutter clean. Those all need cutting in half again, and as mentioned I'm in a rush, so I'm going to use a special method that's only available to liars, cheats and YouTubers. Now we're grooving the top. This chamfer mill doesn't actually cut on the very tip, so I'm basically drag engraving this. So I've got the parts nice and tight in the vise. It's carbide versus aluminium though so I think the carbide will win. Cleaning off the mess that's made. Oops. Please consider giving to Patreon if you'd like me to be able to afford physical coordination classes. Now all these jaws need to go into the vise against the mill stop, and they need a centre hole so they can pivot on the pins I made earlier. I start with the spot drill, and because I have the stop in there, I'll quickly cycle through the parts and get all the spot drilling done, and then cycle through again with the final drill size. It's aluminium, so it's nice and easy to drill. With the stop set up like that, it's also no hassle at all to go back again and use the countersink. And this is the pile of parts we've got so far. If you feel sorry for my cranking arm, please click the like button. I haven't finished yet. There's still some handles, brass washers and handle tips to make. OK, so I've turned down this hex brass to size, and then drilling for 7mm, which is the size of handles I'm using. And we'll get the parting tool aligned, and I've got a transfer punch in the chuck to catch the parts. I'm parting those off to 6mm long. I'm using the file halfway through parting to chamfer the edge and give me a nice finish.
I'm trying to get those collars off with pliers, being careful not to damage the finished faces. Someone said that my back and forth lapping technique was wrong and that figure eight was the right way. So just for that guy, I've included nine minutes of figure eight lapping footage here. Maybe that's enough actually. Am I seriously still lapping? Wow. Do they fit? Yes, they do. They fit nicely. These handles were some hard ground stuff that I think came out of a printer. I just parted them off and faced them to length. It was actually very nice material. And that's how they came out. The instructions say to solder these, but I saw Matty glue them, and I trust Matty's judgement over printed instructions any day of the week. OK, time for assembly. This should go together easy. Oh dear. This is what a panicked pair of hands looks like. No, I just had the wrong parts together. It's okay. Once I figured out the basics, it was pretty easy. Everything fit and all the parts that should move, moved. I put that down to the plans rather than any skills on my part. I think in a couple of areas I had a bit more clearance than needed, but that's because I'm using stainless sheet that's a bit thinner than the 11 gauge the plans call for. The sheet was just what I had in stock. To be honest, a little bit of clearance in a clamp is no big deal. It's not a sterling engine. So we'll use some Loctite for the handle tips. Those just get placed on and the rods are left horizontal so the tips shouldn't move. And there's the finished pair of clamps. They do work brilliantly and they are very substantial. I like how they look like they're part of a robot or something. The plans were great and I can thoroughly recommend them. Thanks for watching, special thanks to patrons and I'll see you all next time.